Hi, everyone. Welcome to Unchained, your no hype resource for all things crypto. I'm your host, Laura Shin. If you've been enjoying Unchained, pop into iTunes to give us a top rating or review. That helps other listeners find the show. Looking to advertise your product on Unchained and Unconfirmed? Reach out to Raylene at laurashinpodcast at gmail.com to find out about sponsorship opportunities. Again, that's Laura Shin, L-A-U-R-A-S-H-I-N, podcast at gmail.com to find out about sponsorship opportunities on Unchained and Unconfirmed. Claim your cryptocurrency passport by connecting a node to the Bitcoin network and help it remain decentralized. Blockdaemon allows you to do just that via its multi-cloud configuration platform. Visit blockdaemon.com slash unchain and launch a Bitcoin node in 90 seconds free for 30 days. The future of lending is here. Alt Lending enables companies to leverage their Bitcoin or Ethereum assets to borrow US dollars. To learn more, go to altlending.com and use promo code UNCHAINED for offer details for an interest-free month. Crypto collateralized. Altlending.com. My guest today is Chengpeng Zhao, founder and CEO of Binance. Welcome, CZ. Uh, hi, Laura. My pleasure to be here. Binance seems to have come out of nowhere to become the world's top crypto to crypto exchange. But in a way, it was actually years in the making. Describe how you learned about Bitcoin, started working in the space, and eventually came to launch Binance. Uh, sure. So um, I first came across Bitcoin in 2013, I think around September-ish. Uh, that's when my friend Bobby Lee, uh, he used to be the CEO of uh, uh, BTC China. He introduced me to Bitcoin and his investor, Ron Cao. Both of them are a good friend of mine. Um, I looked into it and then I went to a conference in uh, Las Vegas at the, in December 2013. And that's when I really, after that conference, I quit my job. So I'm going to do this full time. So that, <laughs> <laughs> and what, wait, what were you doing at that time? So I was, running a, I, was running my, I was running my other startup that I've been with at that point for eight years. Um, so six partners, the company's still there, but I just said, I, I, I want to, I actually wanted to run a Bitcoin exchange with, uh, as part of that startup, but the other partners were not interested. So I said, um, that's fine. I'm, I'm gonna, uh, this, I know I was going to do a blockchain, what we call Bitcoin industry back then full time. So I just I said, okay, I'm going to leave. That's it. Yeah. And that startup was actually focused on doing trading software. Is that correct? Yes, uh, what we call ultra low latency uh, trading, UL, ULL, yeah. And so at that point, I know you started working in this space. What were you doing and how did you eventually come to launch Binance? Yeah, so at, uh, so the previous startup we were doing, we were providing ultra low latency trading software for mostly invest, uh, top investment banks. Um, all the top uh, global, like the names you know, like Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, all use our system. But it's a very niche, high-frequency trading tool for for uh, uh, for those guys. I've been working in the financial trading space, tra the trading technology space for my entire career. So, but when I discovered uh, Bitcoin, I, I I just knew that was the future. So I just said I just gotta be doing something in this space. And um, I I left with I left my pre previous job without having knowing what to do next. But I know where I want to be. So. Huh. And so you eventually went to, uh, I think you started working at blockchain.info, right? Yes, yes. So, uh, yes, uh, I bumped into Roger Ver in Tokyo uh, uh, in end of, Gen end of December, early January 2014. And then we talked. Um, and um, I think I'll, at that time, blockchain.info was just the founder, Ben Reeves, and Nicholas Carey, who joined like a couple months earlier. So I was the third person to join. Um, so uh, yeah. So and blockchain.info had a great uh, or built up by one 22 year old at the time, and then uh, a lot of users, uh, very good feedback, very good community reputation. So I was very uh, lucky to be able to join that company. And then you went to OKCoin. Yes. So blockchain.info is focused on mostly a wallet and a blockchain explorer. Uh, so. Uh, my background uh, has more. Uh, I have more experience in trading systems and exchanges. So uh, OKCoin okay was. Uh, I was talking with my now co-founder He Yi. She was at. A, she joined OKCoin okay a couple months before I did, and she said, "Well, like, all your experiences are in trading systems. Why don't you join us um, as an exchange?" And we talked about it for a little bit. I thought it was a pretty good opportunity. Um, and blockchain.info was growing very quickly at that time as well, and they were getting venture funding from the U.S. 
and the team grow to be a larger size, um, I just said, well, um, it's probably better. Uh, OKCoin at the time looks like a better fit for me. So I, um, so I joined OKCoin. Yeah. And what were you doing there? And then how did you eventually launch Binance? So, yeah, I was the CTO of OK, OKCoin, and I was also helping them with the international side the, the, uh, because out of the three co-founders, uh, myself, Hei, and the CEO, um, I was the more sort of a, a international one. Um, but then um, we had a few culture differences. Um, my background is more international, more Western, I would say almost uh, uh, US-centric, where there's a lot of like, I would say uh, different style of thinking, different style of value systems. Um, so that didn't really go well. With, uh, I, I just thought that was not a, that was not going to work long term. So I left um, just under a year. And then um, I actually, after I left OKCoin, I actually started a different technology company with two of my other friends. And then we were doing trading, we were doing exchange platforms as a cloud solution for other exchanges. There were about 2,000 cultures exchanges in China at the time, and we were providing systems for a number of those. Um, so we were just a system provider. Um, uh, so we built uh, we built a, we built a system from scratch from uh, early 2015, yes. And then uh, when Binance started, we, are, we we took us there was two and a half years of um, development on the system that's already happened. Um, so Binance this platform was not built in one month. Yeah. Yeah. And just to go back to how you were saying before that your background is more Western. As far as I understand, I think you moved to Canada when you were a teenager, right? And then you went to college in Canada and worked in New York and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I was born in China. Um, and then um, I moved to Canada when I was a teenager, when I was 12. And um, I spent high school in Vancouver and university in Montreal. And I did an internship in Tokyo um, as, as a summer job. And then when I graduated, the same company gave me an offer that uh, I couldn't get a better one. So I went back to Tokyo. I really liked Tokyo. So I worked in Tokyo for four years and then went to uh, New York, uh, also worked in New York for four years. Um, and then went back to Shanghai uh, uh, in 2005 and then worked for eight years in the previous startup that I mentioned before. And then then the rest of history connects. So the story about Binance is sort of incredible. You heard about ICOs at a potluck on June 14th, 2017. Had the white paper written in both English and Chinese within three days after that. You began your ICO nine days after that. Then you wrapped it up a week later and had $50 million in the bank. Then within five months, you turned Binance into the world's number one crypto exchange. I heard that at one point you guys had 240,000 new users in one hour. I heard that it took you three months to get to 120,000 users, another three to get to 1 million, and then one week after that to reach 2 million. Correct any of this if any of it's wrong. How did you handle this you know, explosive growth and this really fast pace? Yeah, I think handle is the right word. I think we were just lucky at the right time uh, doing the right thing. So like most of the stuff happened to us. Not that's something we actually thrived or, um, or, 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 or wanted to do. So I think basically we were just, we, it was very lucky for us that we had the system ready to be able to handle that growth uh, near last December, early January. Um, the other stuff was uh, more random chance. Um, I learned about ICO around uh, last April, May-ish. I heard about the word ICO, but I never participated in one. I never read any white papers. I saw, again, I saw another friend of mine doing an ICO uh, right in front of my it's early June to like, I think it was May 30th to June 9th. And he raised $15 million US within 10 days. And that was at that time, that was the largest ICO in China. And um, I know him quite well. And I was thinking, um, if we can do it, I, I probably could do it too. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, uh, and given his background, given what he, what he has done, given his uh, experience, reputation, et cetera, I was thinking maybe I have a good chance as well. And then I talked to Da Hongfei, uh, the, the founder of NEO, uh, and now Ontology. So um, he, he, was very, he was very, very encouraging. And that potluck dinner uh, on June 14th in Chengdu in China last year, um, everyone's like, you got to do an ICO, you got to do an ICO. Uh, the founder of MCO, uh, Monarch, uh, now they rebranded to Crypto.com. 
uh, he was there. He was doing his ICO. He said, look, he, uh, it only took him 15 days and he's still raising, but he's already reached like 13, 14 million dollars. His target was 20. He's like, his preparation was only eight days. You can, he said, no, look, you can do it. <laughs> um, so so you, you, it was that kind of environment. I said, okay, fine. Um, and I had a team already. So we, I had a team of 30 something people from the, uh, from the technology provider startup. So we had a team and it's an international team as well. So we had, we had um, uh, what we call uh, native English speakers. Uh, we had a larger number of them. So we just said, look, let's start a Google Doc write both versions at the same time and we changed the versions uh, we, we basically didn't sleep very much during those two or three weeks yeah <laughs> and and then once you launched how did you handle that massive growth like in five months or what were those like what were some of the kind of crazy moments during that period oh man there were so many crazy moments but um initially our growth was okay it wasn't too bad so initially, during the ICO stage, the growth was so quick that our, uh, our little website couldn't handle it. We we're just buying servers, buying servers, and buying servers. Uh, that, but that was during the ICO stage. Once we launched, the um, uh, growth actually slowed down a little bit uh, because at that time, everybody's chasing ICOs. Um, and um, uh, once we launched, we were a small new exchange. We didn't have that many trading pairs. We didn't have that many coins. Like the the the, uh, the growth was actually just average. It was just normal. And then uh, September came. There was a lot of panic. Um, there was panic selling and panic buying. Even when the market goes panic selling goes really way down, the volume picks up, right? Because everyone's trying to sell. Uh, the trading volume actually goes up. Um, and then the China last September last, around this time, the, there was a lot of FUD or news, negative news about China, and so we had to move our servers. From, so we actually moved our servers from outside China into China first in July because they, we had a large number of Chinese users, and that was a very painful thing. And then by in September, I told my team, look, we gotta move, we gotta move them back out again, and they were like, you're crazy. Now we have a lot more servers. And so, but they did it. <laughs> they did it overnight. And and wait, uh, and that was why because of the ban on the crypto exchanges. Yeah. So basically, there was uh, we have. Uh, I got increasing uh, more amount of convincing information that the ban is coming. I said, okay, look, there's enough. There's there's enough information to make a decision already. So I'm gonna make the decision. It's a really hard decision, but I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna ask the team to move it out. The team agreed. The team, after some hesitation, agreed, and we moved it out. We moved all of our infrastructure out of China a week before the bank came out, like the news came out. So we actually did it before, uh, but that really helped because now we can say, look, we're no longer in China. We move, and we were we were moving the team out of out of China as well, and we said, look, that doesn't affect us anymore. And um, and when the China ban happened, guess where all the users went, or, or at least all the Chinese users went. They they came to Binance, but. A couple of weeks later, we got pressure so 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 badly we had to uh, restrict the Chinese IPs. So we did that, and um, so yeah, it was just a crazy ride. There was, there was so many crazy stuff happening. And any other crazy moments that you want to mention? Oh sure, yeah. Um, I, I didn't know how long you want me to go on that, but for example, during during that time, the Chinese government asked all the anybody who issued ICOs return the uh, coins to the uh, in, 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 return it just just do the refund. Just do the reverse swap, and um, of course our coin is okay because the Binance coin is now six six x the ICO price at that time, and so nobody wanted to return it for the original bitcoins. So nobody, uh, not that many people wanted to return the Binance coin, but we facilitated a couple ICOs on our platform, like five of them, and uh, a number of them have dropped below the ICO price. And of course, all, for all of those users, they all want to get their original BTCs back, and. Um, mm-hmm. We made a very hard call, and the project teams are, are already spent a little bit of money. They can't return the full amount anyway. We made a very really tough decision. We said, okay, Binance is going to cover the difference. We did the calculation. It's going to cost us about $6 million U.S. million. At the time, that's a lot of money for us. We raised $15 million. We spent a bunch of it already. We have a little bit of, uh, left in the bank. Um, so we gotta, so it was, that was like a large chunk of money for us. But we, we, had, a, we had a very quick meeting. I remember I was I was on I was on a train outside of China. We, we had a call. I said, "Look, what are we going to do?" I said, "Let's let's just cover it." And so we returned the full amount to all the investors that bought through our platform, and that created such huge positive publicity for us in China. Like every Chinese user is like, "Binance is the most trusted platform," 
And then when the when the shutdown ha- when the shutdown of other exchanges happened in uh, around the September 30th, all those users came to us. So there was there was a lot of really tough decisions, really 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 crazy times. So we basically made a lot of tough decisions, and um, things worked out okay in the end. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we're going to keep talking about that because I'm really curious about how you do make decisions. But one thing I want to ask is, so right now, how many employees do you have? Uh, we, uh, so I think today or tomorrow, we're going to cross the number 300, 300 warriors. <laughs> oh, wow. And how many users do you have? Uh, I think we're just, uh, I haven't checked for a while, but the re- uh, growth rate have slowed down recently uh, due to the market conditions. I think we, we're, we're, we're a bit north of uh, uh, 10, 11 million users. Okay. And there's been a lot of news, uh, you know, at different points this year about how much you're on track to make and profit this year. So right now at the moment, what are you projecting? Um, I think if we well, if we stay at the current rate, uh, if nothing uh, goes too too crazy or too low, uh, we should target somewhere around uh, five hundred to eight hundred million dollars this year in profit. Okay, all right. So yeah, then I think that means volumes must be down because earlier some said it could be as high as a billion, but maybe you know you've you've seen slower traction on the platform. So something else I wanted to ask you about was regulation. And this goes back to what I meant about decision making. Regulation has been this huge theme in crypto. And I was just wondering in general, what your philosophy regarding regulation is, and how you know how you've been approaching it as you've been building the business. Right, right. So okay, everybody, uh, I think, well, my philosophy on regulation is probably different from many of the, uh, what we call um, the retail investors. I think especially the, the people in the U.S., they seem to be very heavily focused on regulation in the U.S. Uh, we are actually really not that focused on the U.S. Uh, we are focused on everything else other than the U.S. So in the U.S., that's Coinbase and Gemini and a bunch of other exchanges dealing with uh, uh, regulation over there. The rest of the world is a bigger market for us. Uh, so, and uh, the regulations differ by different countries. And um, for most countries, the re- how to regulate this uh, industry, this space that we're in, is not very clear yet. Most of the regulators ad- admit they're still learning and adapting and adjusting uh, or creating regulations. So it's kind of on chatter territory for most uh, countries and most jurisdictions. And we're working very closely with a very large number of them. Uh, although mo- uh, it, most of the countries we work with are relatively small in terms of a population. But we, what we found is um, smaller countries are much easier to work with in terms of regulations. Uh, we can meet with the, like, very, very senior people and the decision makers directly, and they don't think they are above us or they, they, it's more of a cooperative working relationship. So, But I do see that the uh, regulations are becoming there's now competitions on who's the who has the most favorable regulations at least in many parts of the world and, and i think these countries realize that having the a more favorable regulation will ensure their long-term uh, success from an economic development point of view so uh, my view is basically we want to work with people who are willing to work with us and it's a very simple uh, simple model Whereas uh, we are not really chasing, okay, this is the most developed market. That's where all the money is. We gotta, we gotta get those money. Uh, we're not thinking like that. I think if you, if you think like that, it's gotta be U.S. market, China market, and um, uh, wherever else. But we're more into, okay, let's let's look at this long term. Let's look at this five, ten, twenty, fifty years from now, where we're gonna be. So let's. Uh, so that's kind of our view, yeah. But when you say that you're looking that far in the future then I don't understand how you could imagine that the U.S. and China won't figure in. Uh, yes. Well, no. Uh, so, yes, they will definitely fit in. But um, uh, those larger countries are harder to uh, navigate from a, uh, from a uh, regula- regulatory point of view because they, uh, they're more complex. There's, too many, there's many, many different uh, regulatory bodies, departments, uh, states or pro- uh, provinces and federal. They're just, they're just a, it's just a very complex environment, complex environment. So if you look for, so our approach is let somebody else figure it out first. So for example, in the US, let Coinbase and Gemini figure it out first. Um, they're very strong. They, they got the culture background. They got the connections. They got the, they, 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 they're fully embedded over there. So 
um, let them figure it out first. So long term, we would be we would very much be interested uh, if we can. And uh, but I think we're we're not the most fitted for doing for taking the initiative and being the first step in those jurisdictions. Whereas we are taking the lead in a lot of other jurisdictions, such as Malta, such as Jersey, Bermuda, uh, uh, Uganda, and other parts of Africa uh, and some parts of Asia. So um, it's it's really more about who takes the lead like now. Uh, from a regulatory point of view, I think the regulations will probably settle within, uh, I don't know, a year or two to three years. So uh, we'll focus on where we can add more value, where we will let other people add value where they can. Well, so I find your philosophy interesting, but I guess like to my mind, you know, some of the things that you're doing are pretty obviously in violation of securities law. For instance, Binance's coin, BNB, is pretty much the definition of a security, um, at least according to U.S. <laughs> securities law, because it's an investment of money. <laughs> I like that you're laughing um, in a common enterprise, which is Binance. And the profits of that are dependent on an identifiable party, which again is this case is in this case Binance. So you know you've got that. Then you've got the fact that Binance is probably also likely listing other reg- unregistered securities. And so in that regard, like, do you you know try to have controls to keep U.S. residents from using Binance or from buying BNB? Because I tested this myself, and it took me like all of three seconds to create an account on Binance from here in the U.S. Right, right. So uh, I laugh because I think I think that's a very subjective uh, uh, view of uh, what things are, uh, and I appreciate that's your view. I think that's your view, not my view, to be honest, and probably not shared by most of our most of the community. Oh, okay, discussion- just, just to clarify, yeah. um, multiple yeah. sources said to me that they viewed it as a security token combined with, you know, because there are other aspects, obviously, it's a multifaceted coin. But I just wanted you to know it's not only me. I, I discussed this as multi- with multiple people. Right, right. So the, so the way I view it is basically just because multiple people around the world have a view doesn't mean that we all agree. <laughs> so, uh, but there's there's no legal definition that a certain coin, at least Binance coin, is not, at least not defined legally by anybody as a as a, as a security. Uh, many people may think themselves, or there may be even a comment or opinion. It may or may not be. I I, can, I I think for every person that you find that who, who thinks that way, I can, I can find more people who are not. I can find ten people who thinks otherwise. So I think it's a, it's a difference in opinion, but it's definitely not classified legally or uh, anywhere, as far as I know. And to be honest, even if it's classified legally in some countries, it's probably classified differently in other countries. And the whole discussion about whether a coin is a security or not uh, only came some within the last, I don't know, six months or so. Before that, there, was, there wasn't any discussion about whether a crypto coin or ERC-20 coin is or is not a security. Nobody cared. So, oh, no, no, no. Just, just for the record, yeah. I've been discussing this issue with sources since mid-2016. So okay. like people can listen to the podcast I did in September 2016 with Coin Center. We were we talked about that. Okay. So I mean, yeah, this is like kind of a known thing. But I mean, regardless, so you know, is it is that why like I mean, do you try to uh enforce controls to keep US residents from using Binance or buying BNB? Uh not 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 that I know of. So basically, so so far no one has told us that Binance coin is a security other than yourself, to be honest. Many people, uh, some people may think that, but I think the definition of security itself is debated th- uh, among different parts of the world. And I think you are taking a very U.S. centric view, and we're actually really yeah, not yeah. focused on the U.S. No, I'm saying, right? so, yeah, it's really the U.S. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I think yesterday, even after you created your account, you probably could not deposit U.S. dollars in, right? <laughs> so you, you probably did not do a trade. You, you, I, I would probably guess if you created the account yesterday, you did not have any Binance coins right now. Am I correct? Oh, yeah. No, I, I didn't go that <laughs> far. <laughs> right. right. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very contentious topic. But um, uh, at the end of the day, I think, the, uh, uh, I think you are taking a very U.S.-centric view on things where that's a market where we're really not focused on. We don't take the U.S. dollars. Uh, we don't touch U.S. dollars. Um, I've never I've, I've purposely avoided doing any promotion, uh, attending any events in the U.S. just so that we, we are not viewed as a U.S. company. And we don't actively target that market. Yeah. Well, I'm just curious, uh, like, yeah. 
would would you come to a conference in the U.S.? Like, would you plan to step foot in the U.S.? Is that something that you're trying to avoid, or or do you have no fear? Uh, I I don't think I I'm pretty sure I'm uh I, I will not get into trouble by going to the U.S. But number one, it's kind of far. Number two, I don't really want to attract a lot of the, uh, uh I don't really want people to view Binance as a U.S. centric or focused on the U.S. We're really not focused on the U.S. We're doing promotions everywhere else other than the U.S. So, um, I, and uh, to be honest, I've actually turned down a lot of interview requests, like including Yahoo Finance and a, 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 a number of other media uh, outlets in the U.S. We're very centric talking about U.S. markets precisely because of this reason, because all the questions about U.S. and I'm not an expert. Uh, 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 I've lived there before. I know the market. I know the language, but I'm, that's, not, that's not where our core focus is. And just out of curiosity, where do you live? Do you have a home anywhere? Uh, well, I don't have a house. Uh, no, I don't have any. I don't have any property. I don't have any real estate property. Uh, I rent everywhere. So, <laughs> um, I do spend about a, like I spend quite a bit of time in Singapore, uh, Taiwan, Malta, um, Switzerland. Uh, so um, I so again, people have this view like you got to have a base or you got to have somewhere in one city, right? Uh, or you got to have a place. Uh, I don't. I don't have that problem. <laughs> Well, also, if you're a billionaire, then you can maintain multiple homes. <laughs> actually, yeah, actually, that's just okay. So I, I think economically, I can afford it, but time wise, I can't. It's just such a headache all the time. Yes. Okay. I yeah. actually, I agree with that. Um, yeah. So one thing that I also want to ask you about, though, just to go back to the regulatory question, I've seen other interviews where you've said things like, quote, we're okay to do things very creatively to avoid unnecessary regulation. Or another quote, we don't want to be in one place right now because of regulatory uncertainty. And obviously you have this history of moving Binance's offices and servers, it, partly, I think, because you don't want countries to be able to easily determine if they have jurisdiction over Binance. And, you know, those times when you moved out of China, you also moved out of Japan. I think you also had regulatory issues in Hong Kong. Like those three moves, I think, were due to regulatory issues. So some people that I spoke with said that to them, it seems like you are flouting the law. Do you ever worry that you are putting yourself on this path to be, to clash with regulators and that you could end up in jail? Uh Again, I think you are making uh, somebody's else, some random people's opinion to be the holy, to be like a legal, to be a legal enforced, I don't know, uh, uh, ruling or something. A lot of people, because I could think about anything. I could think of, uh, I could think, I don't know, Donald Trump's uh, violating, violating, violating the law. But what I think doesn't really matter. Um, so I, I, I actually <laughs> think the reverse. I fully respect the laws of every country, every jurisdiction. And the but most people are, most people have this mindset that you got to stay in one place and work with one government. But uh, why is that? Like, why can't you go to a place to work with a government that you choose instead of always being stuck in one place and work with a government that may or may not support what you want to do? So in a new in a new in a brand new industry uh, where I'm I'm very third so. There, there, are, there, are, there are fundamental laws, uh, right? Laws are different by country, and the, but there are fundamental stuff you can't do, uh, like uh, hurting people, stealing, scamming, uh, stuff like that. So, and then there are other things like, okay, how do you classify a cryptocurrency? How do you uh, use it as security? Is it not? And this, this kind of things, different countries do it differently. So, what's wrong with going to a country and choosing to live in a country where those things are more viewed favorably for you? Why do you have to be stuck in a, in a country that that are not good for for this kind of stuff. Why, like this is this is like saying, look, why don't you why don't you stay like if you if you if you don't like hot places, why don't you stuck in why don't, why don't you stuck yourself in Florida and in the sun all the time, and you just don't like it, right? Why don't you go to a different city, right? So I, I don't think there's any I don't think there's anything wrong or illegal or anything or even unethical about it. I mean that's just it, it is opportunistic, but why don't you choose the good opportunities for you? We're living we're living in a world where we. Where we where we seek and um, and 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 phrase uh, freedom, right? So this, why don't you use the freedom that you have, right? So it's a free world. You you can choose to be in whichever country, whichever city, whichever place, and you can choose to do whatever profession you want to do within reason. Uh, that are, I think basically cryptocurrency is a new thing. We're not doing anything strange. We're not we're not doing anything hidden. We're not doing anything uh, that's hurting people. 
right? So I think that's uh, I'm not worried about it at all. I don't I don't know why people think in such narrow minded、uh, ways. Well, just for the record, you know, some people that I spoke with did. Kind of go down that line of thinking, and then other people said, "Hey, and and by the way, I just what I did was I I talked with kind of a bunch of lawyers who are involved in the crypto space because I was kind of curious." And、yeah. you know you're right. They didn't all have the same opinion.、Um, you know, one of them was like, "Hey, this is a business guy," and, and in fact, frankly, it was kind of funny. He was a lawyer, and he was like, "Don't talk about the regulatory stuff too much. It's going to be boring."、Um, <laughs> but but anyway, he was like, "Oh, well, I view CZ more as just like a business person, you know, sort of in the model of Uber, which you know obviously didn't." Follow all the regulations from its, you know, in its early days. So I was just kind of curious, like, how do you see yourself, or, or maybe you don't have, you know, some view of yourself in relationship to regulation. But I was just kind of curious, like, are you trying to make some kind of a point, or, you know, do you have any particular purpose to your regulatory stance?、Uh, so I don't, I don't have a,、um, so I, I'm, so I don't really have a stance against or、uh, uh, with regulatory. But my,、uh, our whole point is to increase the freedom of increase the freedom of choice, right? So we want to we we,、uh, we fully believe that the cryptocurrency blockchain is a new technology that helps the world, and、uh, it has because of the new new technology, it has a, a few uncertainties in terms of regulations、uh, or what the regulators want to do with it. But I'm not against or for regulation. I just want so we just want to help、uh, increase this adoption of crypto around the world where we can. There are certain parts of the world which、uh, the tax becomes very hard, so we uh, uh, we don't do that.、Uh, we we focus on parts、uh, parts of the world that's、uh, easier. We do work very closely with many many regulators and trying to help them if they want advice from us. We will give them if they ask us what what's important to us. We will say it very openly. If they tell, if they ask us、uh, what other parts of the world are doing、uh, in their regulations, we will give them what what, what we know. So my stance is, we want to help the regulations be, become healthier, become、uh, what you call.、Uh, I, I, will, I wouldn't I wouldn't even use the word right. I just want to use the word、uh, appropriate for、uh, more growth, for healthy growth. So we want to help. Uh, we don't view regulations as、uh, we all. I also don't view as regulations as against us. I think some regulation is good, probably, and overregulating will will kill the industry at least in those jurisdictions where those things apply, and that will be bad for them long term. So it's actually bad for them, not bad for us.、Uh, we will go elsewhere、um, if that happens. So、um, I'm not I'm not against it. I just think okay, it's. It's a brand new game,、uh, and we 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 already started playing the game, and now we're trying to figure out the basic rules of the game.、Uh, which is basically like a bunch of kids playing games, right? So you first start playing, and then you try to figure out some rule.、Um, so I think that's okay.、Uh, that's just how the world works.、Um, so I'm not against or for it. I just want to help people make better regulations. If we focus on regulations, but our real focus is actually just help people、uh, get access access to crypto. We're going to discuss trans mining and Binance's upcoming decentralized exchange. But first, I'd like to take a quick break for our fabulous sponsors. A startup that completed an ICO and looking to leverage Ethereum for working capital. A miner looking to buy more rigs without having to sell Bitcoin. Alt lending can help. Alt lending enables companies to leverage their Bitcoin or Ethereum to borrow U.S. dollars while retaining ownership of their crypto assets. We bring years of financial and technological expertise to the blockchain space. Access to institutional capital means borrowers don't have to wait weeks to receive a loan. Our simple and efficient vetting process makes getting a loan easy. No membership tokens or complicated signups required. To learn more, go to altlending.com and use promo code Unchained for offer details for an interest-free month. Asset lending reimagined. Altlending.com. Confused by the mishmash of blockchain protocols and platforms, let Blockdaemon worry about the best blockchain configuration for you via its multi-cloud platform. Blockdaemon supports the leading blockchain protocols, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, Stellar, Quorum, Fabric, and more. What Heroku does for the cloud, we do for blockchain networks: easy deployment, decentralization, and management of nodes, no matter what configuration. Visit blockdaemon.com/unchained and test us out for yourself. Launch a Bitcoin node free for 30 days. Learn more at blockdaemon.com/unchained. This ad spot could be yours. 
Got a great product or service for Unchained or Unconfirmed listeners? Reach out to Raylene at laurashinpodcast at gmail.com to find out about sponsorship opportunities on Unchained and Unconfirmed. Again, that's laurashinpodcast at gmail.com. L-A-U-R-A-S-H-I-N podcast at gmail.com. I'm speaking with CZ, founder and CEO of Binance. What do you think of Shapeshift's recent decision to implement AML KYC? They, like you, were, you know, or I mean, and still are, at least at this moment, a crypto to crypto exchange and didn't have accounts. Um, I don't really have any. Actually, I didn't really know that until you told me just this second. Oh, <laughs> so really? I think, oh, it was such yeah. big news last week. Uh, well, it, actually, I did hear it very vaguely, but I got distracted. I didn't read into it. Um, but I. It's it's a business it's a business decision Eric Rohe and his team probably made uh, for it's very it's a very difficult to judge a business decision from the outside without knowing all the internal um, factors that that, w- that went into consideration. So I think basically if they did it, uh, they probably had some business reason to do it. I know Eric is a very smart guy, so I yeah I can't really comment on that. And for listeners who are interested in more information on that, I did do an episode of Unconfirmed on this decision with Catherine Wu of Masari. So um, there's more information there. I also wanted to ask, you know, just going back to this question about whether or not coins are securities, I heard on the Epicenter BTC podcast, uh, the interview that you did with them, that you said that your process of legal review for listing coins is that you ask the token teams to get a lawyer to provide a statement asserting that their token is not a security. Isn't that kind of like asking the fox to guard the hen house? Um, sh- uh, yeah, yeah. I don't agree with that, but what else can we do? Like, uh, If there's other better solutions, I'm, I'm all up for it. Oh, and just why? Like, you you don't feel like you would have a legal team that could do that kind of review? Uh, well, then it's, it's still it's still a bunch of lawyers who are doing that, right? So how, right, but they're how, not being paid by the, but they're not being paid by the team that wants to try to get their token listed. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, what we would do from a business perspective is we would charge the we would charge the listing teams to to pay to cover those costs anyway. So um, I don't think I don't think those are going to be hugely different. I mean, basically, right now, I, nobody knows how to determine if a coin is a security or not. There's no clear guideline uh, uh, anywhere. I think there's a Howey test, which, but the Howey test fails for most cryptos, even in the U.S., because most cryptos can be transferred very, very easily, whereas most securities can't. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm not an expert in that area, um, um, and uh, we rely on experts. And whether we hire them and charge that fee back to the uh, uh, coin uh, the coin teams, um, or they they find somebody. So right now we're just doing what we think are um, the most logical thing to do. And I know in general, like a lot of people are concerned about these exchanges. You know, not just issues about regulation, but also, you know, concerns about things like market manipulation and other things like that. So I was just curious, does Binance have its own internal policies and procedures regarding things like insider trading or auditing or any other kinds of self-regulation? Uh, yes, we do have we do have some uh, rules and guidelines. So yeah, I mean, our, uh, our employees can hold crypto, but when they buy, they, ha- they got to at least hold for 30 days before they sell. So this is very. This is a, like a policy we learned from the banks uh, back in the way old banking banking days. Um, that's kind of our internal policy. We don't and we don't we don't let our employees day trade, and it's not a productive thing to do anyway for most of them. And uh, uh, we discourage other uh, kinds of market manipulation. We have some AI learning tools that uh, uh, with risk with, with risk management now. Um, if a coin price fluctuates too heavily, um, and we have now uh, intervention processes, um, but they're relatively soft. We don't have circuit breakers because the uh, crypto is traded on multiple markets. So yeah, we have some, but they are there, and we're still we're slowly evolving them as well. So hopefully, with time, they'll get more and more mature. And some people were saying that they think that there's wash trading and market manipulation happening on Binance. They mentioned that there's often fairly high volume of trading in pretty obscure coins, 
it during short time periods that don't seem to really be tied to news. Do you try to prevent that in any way? Yes. So um, uh, I think if you look at the market research uh, done by independent like uh, community members, uh, Binance is probably the only one they said they could not find any signs of uh, 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 watch training or, or pumping volumes or fake volumes. So that's why that's, as an exchange, we actually, we're actually very, very careful about that. Um, but uh, on the topic of watch training and manipulation, so uh, it's it's a really tricky one because basically, what it how do you define manipulation? How do you define watch trading? So like let's say, a, a Bitcoin is like I don't know six sixty three hundred US dollars on one exchange. If some guy just want to buy it all the way on Binance, all, all the way on, all the way up to seven thousand US dollars, the guy just has lots of money. He just wants to buy. Uh, is that manipulation or is that not? It's kind of really hard to define. And w- at what quantity? Uh, if it just does one trade and comes back down, I, um, um, so it's really it's really hard to tell at what time at what at what stage does that become manipulation? And w- is it a volume? Is it just a price uh, percentage difference from other exchanges? But how like what about a coin that only trades on one market? So there's a lot of uh, when you actually like conceptually, yes. If, if, if Bitcoin is 6,300 in other exchanges right now and it's traded at 7,000 in some other exchange, then most likely is some type of manipulation. But how do you define it? How do you prevent it? And like, and also, and watch trading is the same thing, right? Let's, let's say two accounts are just trading against each other um, at, at a very high percentage base. What, at what point do you do you define that as watch trading? Like, do, if they do like four orders back and forth, that's watch trading, or because they will be trading with other people as well. Even if they only want to trade against each other, they will have to trade with other people in the market. Um, so, at what point do you kick in and say we lock those accounts and well, we freeze those accounts? Um, and let's say we say, okay, if you trade if you trade over a hundred k within five minutes against each other, we we define that as watch trading. Guess what's going to happen? Uh, they're gonna trade ninety nine k every five minutes, and, they, <laughs> and 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 they're gonna have and they're gonna have four accounts trade or three accounts or four accounts uh, trading against each other. So at what point? And then we can lower it again. But it's a it's a it's a mouse and cat uh, cat game, right? So the problem is it's very hard to define scientific like uh, quantitatively what exactly it is without them able to go in, uh, around the rules. So we do try. Uh, I think we're probably one of the one of the players, one of the exchanges that try the hardest in this regard that we actually don't advertise, uh, but people know. Uh, so the, uh, the 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 smart traders know, and the the uh, the higher the, the the serious traders come to us, and the rest follow. So that's why we are we are able to maintain such a lead uh, such a lead on the uh, uh, on the uh, if you look at page views or or, or, or unique views. Uh, we we have such a lead right now, so people know. Uh, if you look at volume, uh, a lot of the volume out there is fake, uh, or at least have some fakeness to it. Um, uh, a fake is not a black and white word, uh, as I just explained before. So it's kind of really hard to define what exactly is fake volume. Uh, but we are definitely one, one of the most honest ones out there. So we try. We try. It is a problem in this industry, and I think everybody should try. I think as, as exchange operators, we should definitely all try to be ethical, to be fair about it, and to address the issue uh, square and upfront. And as, but also as, as as traders, as users, we should you should really uh, just uh, abandon those exchanges that have suspicious behavior and go for the le- legit ones. Can you go into more detail on BNB for me? As far as I understand, people can use it to trade for to pay for trading fees and they'll get a discount. They can also participate in ICOs on the Binance Launchpad. Um, some vendors, I guess, accept it as payment and you're going to use it in the future a decentralized exchange that you're creating. But I was just curious, like, what rights do holders of the BNB token have in terms of information or voting or financial rights? All right. So BNB token is not a security. It's not shares of Binance. So those questions about rights are assuming that there are certain things which they're not. Um, so the BNB token, as we defined, uh, have a few uh, advantages. Number one, you do get discounts if you use that to pay for fees. So it's more like a discount card uh, 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 mechanism. And the discounts disappear after five years. So every year, the, uh, the discount rate drops about half and disappears in year five. Um, and the, the second thing about Binance Coin is every quarter, uh, t- uh, Binance will use 20% of our profits and to buy back and burn them, destroy them. So basically taking more coins out of circulation. Uh, financially, this is a very similar uh, effect to giving a dist- uh, dividend distribution. 
but uh, mechanically, we're not sending any money money out. We're just destroying money we have, or we're just just destroying coins we have. And um, again, there's a limit to that. We will only destroy up to half uh, uh, of all the out, uh, total issued amount, which is 100 million. Uh, the total 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 issued amount is 200 million, and we're going to destroy 100 million eventually. Um, looks like it's going to take a number of years based on the current rate because now the price of Bitcoin uh, went up so much. Now uh, we can um, uh, the dis- destroying rate is low, but people are happy because the price went up. Um, and the third, uh, the third thing is that uh, uh, Binance Coin will be used as the uh, to pay for fees on the Binance chain, uh, which is g- going to be on its own blockchain, a uh, a decentralized exchange. Uh, so in that regard, it's very similar to Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, it's just you can use that to pay for fees. Uh, if you do choose to use our uh, if you do choose to use our blockchain later, um, so that should come out uh, uh, soon as well. So <clears throat> we're we're very actively working on that, and so those are the things we promised as our part of our white paper. And in addition to that, now we're we're pushing very aggressively to get BNB adoption into other people's ecosystems. So you, you should be able to use BNB to pay for coffee. You should be able to use BNB to um, uh, to buy airplane tickets, to travel to uh, Australia, to do all of this uh, other things. So we fully for uh, so BNB is not BNB does not equal to Binance shares. They 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 have no they don't have voting rights in in the company they, uh, uh, or in our team. Uh, so it's not it's not it's not securities uh, in my mind. Uh, there are people who may want to define it as is, but I don't think any any official place have defined it as is. So, well, that's kind of interesting to me what you said about how you want to eventually have BNB used to pay for other things because, you know, typically, at least so far in the crypto space, the tokens that have been used for money are decentralized, like Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Monero. And here you're creating this sort of like company coin that you want other vendors to use and, and for people in general to use as as money? Is that the vision there? Uh, no, uh, it's actually not a company coin. Um, so the, the Binance coin itself lives on the blockchain. Right now it lives on the Ethereum blockchain. Very soon you will have it, uh, our, we will have our own blockchain, which is also a decentralized platform. So in that regards, we're, we're, we're the same as all the coin you just mentioned. And uh, it's not a coin uh, from uh, by the company. Uh, it's still a community. Uh, we are the issuers. We have issued it, and people have bought it, and it's been sp- spread out. And we do hold quite a large number of it, but we're not going to be able to issue anymore. So we no longer have, we no longer have a lot of control on the coin. Uh, what we could control is basically we can, as we are still the very large share uh, holders of the coin, we are incent- we are financially incentivized to make the coin worth more, and we're do- we're 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 incentivized to work really hard to add more utility, to add more use cases. The more use cases the coin has, the more utility value you will have, and and then hence the hence the price. So we're we're very encouraged to do that. But other than that, yeah, it's no longer some, it, see it's yeah, statements so, like that that make me think. Oh, that sounds like a security. It's like XRP. It's it's so similar to me. But anyway, keep going. But but I think I think uh, working very hard to want to try to increase the value of something that you hold. Is not is not wrong. That doesn't make it a security. Uh, um, like for example, I I evangelize for uh, Bitcoin, and because I do hold it, that doesn't make Bitcoin a security. So uh, and we do not promise returns. We do not we we do not promise any returns. We do not promise you will go up in value. We're just saying that we're working very hard to. In, we're just saying what we do. We're working very hard to try to increase the value of Binance Coin and a number of other crypto coins. To be honest, at the same time, including including Bitcoin. So. Um, that itself does not make it a security. Yeah, I want to ask about the tokens that you list. Also, um, I know that there's no one set price to have. A, if I, you know, if I want to have my token listed on Binance, but what is the range of fees that I might pay for that? Like, you know, low end and high end. It's usually it's usually around a couple hundred thousand dollars. To be honest, um, it's usually around that range. And what do those fees cover? Why is it that expensive? Well, number one, um, uh, we, there is a lot of work uh, in go, that goes on, and that, and the work's ongoing. Whenever they have an upwarded upgrade, we got to upgrade. Whenever whenever there's a security issue, there's a blockchain fork, uh, we have to do a lot of work. 
But uh, I will be honest that it's not a fee for work. Uh, uh, we, for us, the ROI for doing that type of work is like we basically don't have to do it at, at all. Uh, I think uh, generating profits uh, from a platform, uh, well, generating revenue from a platform is, is, uh, is a high return for us. Uh, number two, uh, we provide such value for those coins. I mean, uh, the, that, that fee should be like, it's basically zero. Uh, uh, we, like, we provide such value for coins, we, uh, giving their liquidity, giving them like our, our large user base, giving them the uh, credibility because now they pass Binance reviewed. It's worth way more. Um, but you know um, we are profitable already. We don't we don't want to destroy the market. Uh, we want the whole ecosystem to be healthy. So many people have actually wrong perceptions about us. Yeah, but if you understand the like basically if you understand the industry, if, if you understand how much value we're providing to those projects we list, um, this is why none of the projects that listed on us complain about it at all. Like nobody said after the list, oh they paid too much in listing fees. And you have a lot more coins available than the vast majority of exchanges. And we're kind of at this point in the development of the crypto space where probably only, you know, a handful, maybe at most a dozen of these are really going to succeed. So how do you feel about making so much money off of at least some portion of your customers who might be speculating on bad investments and losing money. Well, I think that's the that's a very negative way to word that question. And it's a very it's a little bit of a deceiving way to do it. Um, so most of the ICO projects are startup projects, and I think everyone should know that startup projects do have a very higher failure rate. It's the same thing as if you uh, uh, in the in in the traditional investment world. So. Uh, a number of it's the same thing as, uh, uh, as the internet, right? So how many internet companies survived here today? But the internet itself did not disappear. That, that industry did not go away, um, and they are very they are very profitable profitable internet companies. Um, so um, it's still early stages in the industry. Uh, there's nothing that we are doing or not doing. That's uh, it's not like we it's not like we are we are we are it's not like we're scamming users for their money. We're just we're right, just a platform I mean, that provides like liquidity. Could... You could be listing so, fewer coins, like you know, only the highest quality or something. So you could say the same thing about Nasdaq, right? Or, or, or uh, so like, uh, is every company that listed uh, making money for their users? I don't think so. So wh- why did they list so many companies? Um, not sure. So the, the so you're blaming the marketplace provider for for uh, for bad shops or for for bad players. We're we're just a pl- platform provider. Right, so uh, a lot of people lost money investing in internet companies, but is the internet bad, or is Nasdaq bad? Probably not, right? So uh, there is, there are risks in investing, and uh, we're doing our best to educate users to 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 to, to provide them. We're def- we're by far the best platform now out there, uh, in, in in both selection of coins, selection of projects, our internal process, our external process. Uh, our ethical uh, 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 values, etc. So we're, we're we're by far the best. And um, uh, but yeah, I, think I think you're looking like, at, in terms yeah. of the Nasdaq comparison. The only difference is that, of course, because those are public offerings, without those come with disclosures. But in the crypto space, obviously, you know there there isn't that kind of thing going on. So it you know the quality of the information is probably quite variable right but you but you're but you're assuming that i'm not i'm, I'm not even sure if i agree with that to be honest um there uh but you're assuming that's one one situation is better than the other which i don't agree with but i also don't agree with the uh the very fundamental statement that there's more information disclosure than there is in icos uh for those companies because i, I would say there's more structured information disclosure they they're they're, they're very structured uh, because they they have a they have a very set uh, structure in place, but uh, how many how many listed companies have fudged their financial reports, uh, moved uh, uh, moved income from the next quarter onto this quarter or this quarter onto the next? Uh, how many like there's a lot of stuff that goes on which are not uh, which are questionable uh, to be honest because people people figure once you make the rules of the game people figure out how to get around the rules. Uh, whereas in the ICO space, is right now there's not a lot of rules, but it's really depend. It's it's, it's a very crowd driven. How many telegram groups decide, discuss about scams and 
uh, other questionable behavior. If you look on Twitter, there's a lot more information about those things that happen in the community, in the crowd, where I personally believe like 5,000 people discuss, openly discussing, disclosing, disclosing things about a project, probably more useful than a couple of analysts just sitting there getting paid very highly and providing a report. Uh, the report is more structured, yes. Um, but I'm not sure if the information quality is higher or lower. Um, I don't know. A lot of people I spoke with also were so curious about your decentralized exchange. How yeah. How is that going to look? And why does it need its own blockchain? Um, so basically, yeah, so uh, it's coming along uh, quite well, actually. Um, and uh, it's going to be a specialized blockchain just for uh, uh, trading tokens. So we want speed. So speed is, a, a fe- uh, we want speed over features. So feature-wise, it's going to be very simple. And, and, but that's also why we can achieve higher speed. So, um, uh, and um, I think most people don't realize that, most people think of features when they talk about something, but they don't realize in order to achieve scale, you need speed. Uh, you actually don't need a lot of features. So even if you look at Binance.com, the number of order types or the, the, the features are quite simple, uh, but we can handle large amounts of stuff. So um, uh, that's also the same thing with our decentralized uh, blockchain. So that's basically what it is. Uh, you'll, you'll come oh, up and, in a wait, few and, months. Yeah. And that's why the blockchain has to be, or, and that's why you need your own blockchain for speed? Yeah, so we, uh, yeah, basically, if you use any, if you adapt any existing blockchain or use a general purpose blockchain that can handle, that can do a lot of stuff, it's very hard to optimize for speed. Uh, we took a lot of stuff out. We're making a more specialized blockchain, uh, a, a more special purpose blockchain that's more focused on, more focused on speed. And I know you're probably tired of these questions, but I am so curious. Will your DEX require KYC AML procedures? Uh, I don't think so. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not aware of any DEX that that does that. Right. I mean, you can't do that right now on Bitcoin or Ethereum. I think like some of them probably have relayers that can do that. But yeah, you're right. Like, well, actually, that leads me to another question. Are you guys doing your an on chain order book, kind of like an Ether Delta? uh, Oh, okay. Yes, so we uh, the current plan is a on-chain order book that's still very fast, and uh, the, yeah, the um, KYC when you decentralize, who's doing it? <laughs> that's the problem. Most, yeah, KYC, I, most KYC solutions are, are, are centralized, right? You gotta have some you gotta have some centralized party who's doing the KYC, who's actually doing looking at the passports that's uploaded, uh, running criminal checks against the, the centralized databases, who, and those are very costly. Those are, uh, we use those. So those are very expensive. So uh, on a de- you know, decentralized blockchain, who's going to do that? Who's going to pay for it? You recently acquired a crypto wallet, Trust Wallet. Why was this your first acquisition? You did admit that it doesn't even have a lot of users. So I was curious what you're trying to accomplish with this purchase. Uh, it's a great product. Uh, it, it's uh, that's a great. Uh, so Trust Wallet is a great find. Um, it's one of those things where it's a technology team. And um, they're very focused on building a product, but they they have not they've done zero marketing. Uh, only a small niche number of people know them. I have full confidence they will have a large number of users very very quickly. The product is awesome. The, it's by far the best wallet out there, uh, the best mobile wallet out there. So, and the, uh, I met with Victor, the uh, the founder of that team. Uh, he shares exactly the same visions as we do. Um, we talked about for we, I, I had a call with him for uh, for like. 10 minutes. And then I had another, uh, I met with them for, 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 for another couple of hours. We, we got the deal done. So uh, I'm very, very bullish on Trust Wallet. And I think it's a great product. Uh, they, lack, uh, they lack a few marketing uh, skills or, 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 or ability right now, which we can, which we can fully complement. So I think uh, that's just a no brainer. Um, and um, uh, I think by, by working together, both sides will, will, will benefit a lot more than working separately. And we both agree. So I'm going to actually collapse my next few questions into one because sure. you've been making me these, these other moves like you are working on creating a crypto bank that will be user owned. You have this $1 billion Binance ecosystem fund. So I just kind of want to hear, I mean, you have other initiatives as well, but I just kind of want to hear, you know, what your vision is of what Binance will become and what products and services users will be able to um, enjoy from Binance and also really what it means for them to be user owners. Sure. So um, basically, 
Our goal is just to, again, increase the adoption of crypto. So by uh, to do that, we want to provide the core infrastructure services in this industry. We want to make the industry bigger. So I think our goal right now is not to take more market share in this current space. We are already the biggest exchange uh, in most by most measurements. Um, but just taking market share off other people right now doesn't make any sense. What we should do is make the make the make the industry ten, a hundred, a thousand, or even one million times bigger. Um, so if we do that, then if we if we if we if we provide if well, all Binance has to do is provide a, a few infrastructure key services in this industry, and we'll 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 we'll, we'll be pretty well off. So that's all our goal. So. Um, in order to grow this industry, we got to make investments into other uh, into other areas which we're not experts in. So if we're not experts, we should just invest in others who are experts and let them do the let them do the do their job. So this includes wallets, uh, faster blockchains, um, payment services, uh, even gaming infrastructures, um, other like uh, uh, there's a lot of other infrastructure stuff going on. So that's kind of our investment uh, arm, and also. Right now, uh, banks are um, not uh, banks are a bottleneck for uh, money flow, and we want to increase the freedom there as well. So we we want to uh, we want to work closely with banks to increase the flow between to increase the uh, uh, bandwidth of uh, uh, to or at least increase the freedom of exchange between fiat and crypto. And uh, we can work with banks, we can acquire banks, and we can set, uh, try a few things ourselves. So all of those are different experiments we're doing, trying to make the industry bigger. Um, the goal, yeah, is to make the industry bigger. And just out of curiosity for this crypto bank, how is that different from a wallet exactly? I don't know if I really know what the difference is. Uh, that, uh, that, that crypto bank holds fiat. That's a fiat bank. So that's a, tr- a traditional paper money uh, bank, whereas Trust Wallet it holds only crypto. Uh, that's a wallet for holding your coins. Uh, those two are very different things. The bank is still going to be regulated by the banking regulators, et cetera. So it's a more of a crypto friendly bank, uh, but it's still a bank. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so earlier I mentioned that I wanted to chat about trans mining. Um, this is kind yeah. of a really interesting phenomenon. Can you explain what that is for listeners and also why you're critical of it? Sure. Um, Trans mining is a very uh, innovative way for a uh, uh, distribution of their initial coins, which is basically a, a, a more complex or more uh, convoluted uh, ICO uh, mechanism. Uh, basically, you pay for commission fees and get the coins, which is the same as you pay Bitcoin and buy your coin, which is just a slightly different mechanism. Um, but the whole fundamental uh, uh, it was very um, in, it was very innovative in, in concept, but uh, in reality, the um, economics don't work. And it's basically that every, everybody who did it turned out to be intentionally or unintentionally turned out to be a scam. Basically, anybody who participated, most of them lose, lost money. So uh, it doesn't work. And all the exchanges who are doing it have stopped. Um, I've been saying that since like three or four months ago when they started. But uh, some people believe me, some people didn't. But the results are pretty clear now. So I think that's the thing of the past and um, just stay off trans mining. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's the short answer of it. Right. It's like the exchange would kind of basically reimburse you your trading fee in their coin. And you were saying it was like kind of another way of doing an ICO, right? Yes. But like they do, they do, they do things very, uh, so um, there's a few different variations of it, but the most basic model is, okay, so you pay for, let's say one Bitcoin in, in commission fees. They give you one Bitcoin equivalent in the platform coin, but at the same time, they also unlock 100% equal in value, uh, the team's portion, and they give you 20% extra for the guy who referred you. So now there's 220% being released into market of the platform coin, but only one, only 100% mm-hmm. of the uh, Bitcoin going in. Over time, the coin price is going to drop, uh, given that demand supply. That, that, uh, that's, that's just very basic. Um, and um, there's a bunch of other things they 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 they, they paint like they paint very rosy pictures around it like dividend on uh, on commission fees etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, at the end of the day, the model doesn't work. It's it's fun, it's innovative, uh, but uh, uh, financially it just doesn't work. Last question for you. You know, this kind of goes back to the beginning of the interview when you were talking about how. You have spent time both in the West and in Asia, and I know you continue to do that, obviously, when you were saying that you keep rentals in Malta and Switzerland and 
I, I forget the Singapore, I forget the other places. But I'm so curious to know, how would you compare and contrast Asia's cryptocurrency scene with the American scene or the Western scene? Um, the crypto scene in different co- in different countries, the continents are very interesting, actually. So I think in um, in America, this all of, it's all about uh, anti AML. Uh, so it's all it's re- like the regulations are really more more about terrorists. So how do we uh, control and starve those terrorists? Um, and uh, so doing exchanges in the U.S. is very very difficult because of the money anti money laundering laws. But U.S. is very technology savvy, so there's a very strong startup scene. So anything that involves technology innovation is 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 highly encouraged and it's quite easy. So there's a lot of new use cases uh, in the U.S. Um, different te- different th- things other than exchanges. Um, there's only there's only a very small handful of exchanges in the U.S. Europe is quite interesting, where the user adoption is probably the highest. You can pay for food, you can pay for hotels, you can you can register a company and pay lawyer fees, all in crypto. Um, so um, uh, Europe, given that it's a European Union, and they kind of uh, they don't view their own currency as a very strong thing. So that and they they also know cross border transactions, etc. So there's a very high uh, adoption on uh, on usability there. And in Asia, it's kind of divided. Um, uh, in China, there's a, there are a lot of exchanges, even though exchanges are supposed to be banned. Uh, but there are a lot of <laughs> Uh, but there are, I mean, basically, what does that mean, right? So you register a company offshore and your team's still in China and you have like a, a thousand people team in China. Everybody knows where they are. Everybody knows who they're working on. But they claim to be a subcontractor of the company, of the offshore company, which they're different, of course. So then they're okay. And the Chinese, uh, the Chinese mentality is very different from the rest of Asia where they have a horde mentality of following other people who make quick money. Um, they, they, the, the making mm-hmm. quick money mentality is very, very strong in China, I guess, because of the uh, less, uh, the lesser stability uh, economically and politically, potentially. So uh, people are more uh, uh, things change too quickly. And people are very if you have a 10 year plan, three months later, it's going to be shuttered because the a new regulation <laughs> comes out. Um, so people just focus on three months. Uh, so China is a very different market. And whereas China's completely banned um, uh, payments. And also the domestic uh, traditional payments for WeChat Pay and Alipay are very strong. Like nobody use, nobody carries cash in China, um, so it's, it's all electronic money. It's, um, so that's also very convenient, which kind of dwarfs the payment needs for uh, Bitcoin either uh, for crypto as well. Uh, outside of China is very interesting. Japan is very interesting. Japan is very pro crypto, but their regulations on exchanges are too dense. There's just too many rules, and it's, uh, it's very hard for those guys to compete. So and Korea is very interesting. Korea has a hundred percent adoption on on crypto. Everybody has crypto, as of some kind. So so any any and also Korea has one of those democratic and um, uh, and less powerful governments. Any politician that's against crypto gets voted down very quickly. Uh, Singapore's interest. So Singapore's interesting. Singapore's like kind of wait and see. They're very strict on financial controls, and they kind of it's a smaller economy or smaller. Uh, it's a smaller country in terms of population, so uh, but it's very open in terms of uh, looking at new things. Um, so the world is very interesting. Africa is just getting started. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a very interesting world. Um, I think what's going to happen in the future is going to be more exciting than what happened in the past. You know, I actually, do you mind if we take one minute? And I just want to ask you one last yeah, no question. Worries. Sure. You were on the cover of Forbes last winter for the issue covering the Forbes crypto rich list. And at that time, it estimated your net worth was between one and 2 billion. And obviously this happened, what was it? It was, um, I guess, seven months after you launched Binance. How did it feel to amass so much wealth so quickly? To be honest, I, I actually don't feel that much different. Um, I don't spend any money. That's the, that's the problem. <laughs> so, uh, the only difference... So the, I actually don't spend a lot more. Uh, I don't spend. I don't have a car. I don't. Ha, I don't have a yacht. I don't have a private jet. I have none of those things. I buy just electronics, and um, uh, I fly like uh, business class. So that's the only difference it makes for me. Um, but what's more interesting is I. Uh, it does getting on the cover of Forbes did make men, a mentorship for me, which is I, I know I should no longer care about money, which is what that thing taught me. So I actually don't think about money anymore. And the most expensive resource I have now is time, which is the same for everybody. It's very fair. 
24 hours a day for everybody. So time is the most limited resource, and there's no way to expand it. So that changed my thinking a little bit, but it didn't change me financially or my my spending habits. None of those things. And actually, it kind of, it, it happened so quickly, it kind of destroyed my interest in money or all, the, all those other expensive hobbies or getting on yachts, getting like, I don't know, expensive food. I, I, that kind of destroyed it for Orlando. me, actually, because uh, or a Lambo, because I, well, when I see guys driving a Lambo, I'm thinking, yeah, I, I can buy one if I want to. But do I want to? Nah, uh, I, I, <laughs> I might, I, I, I've never seen I've never sat in a Lambo in my life and I've never <laughs> taken a private I've never taken a private jet in my life so far. Uh, but I know that if I want to, I could. That's all it matters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with you about time being the most precious resource. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for accommodating that last additional questions because because of how precious our time is. This has been an incredibly fascinating discussion. I've really, really enjoyed it. Where can people learn more about you and Binance? Um, I think most most of most of our stuff is pretty public. Just Google us. <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty simple. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks for coming on Unchained. All right. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about CZ and Binance, check out the show notes inside your podcast episode. New episodes of Unchained come out every Tuesday. If you haven't already, rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. If you liked this episode, share it with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. And if you're not yet subscribed to my other podcast, Unconfirmed, I highly recommend you check it out and subscribe now. Unchained is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Raylene Gallipoli, Fractal Recording, Jenny Josephson, Rahul Sayuretti, and Daniel Ness. Thanks for listening.